Saturday Conversation. I'm joined by Brian Newbert and Tom Deanhart. want to thank our sponsor, the Purdue Union Club Hotel, newly reinvented facility on campus. It's a beautiful one. And uh, on this kind of, it's a gorgeous day in West Lafayette. People are out and around and, and uh, making their way on campus. And that's one of the great things that uh, once we get back to having a lot of people on campus, the Purdue Union Club will have uh, have a lot of that as well. And also want to remind folks too, that if you're interested in, in, in that, uh, subscribing to goldenblack.com, we have 40 day free trials available and we've had a lot of people taking advantage of that. Obviously a lot of basketball coverage, Brian's uh, knocking out of the park with that as we get to head to the NCAA, Big Ten and NCAA tournament. And of course, Tom with uh, spring football. Uh, we'll start today in a sad note, certainly, and uh, we talked last week, and I'm glad we did. Uh, we did talk about to Larry, last week's uh, com- Sunday conversation, I believe it was Larry's birthday, his 74th birthday, and of course, uh, most of the Purdue uh, nation, so to speak, knows of Larry's passing late, to, or actually it was early this morning uh, from his home, or he was in Florida, I should say, and uh, you know, I, I want to start with you, Brian. We we have known you known Larry and uh, Tom. I guess probably knew him a little earlier, at least listening to him. But you've known Larry, working with him here at Golden Black over the years, and uh, uh, a sad day for Purdue basketball. Even after a great win last night, it uh, uh, certainly a moment of pause uh, and to commemorate a, 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 a very examined life in Larry Clisby. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's uh, he's obviously somebody who's been very much missed all season long. This is Purdue's first, you know, season without him. Um, He's, he was an an enormous part of the program. I mean, he was, there were times like in the NCAA tournament when we could go in the locker room and stuff like that, you, you, you'd see him in the room with the coaches and the way people fawned over him. You didn't know who the head coach was (laughs) Um, because of the, the, the gravity he carried with him. And it was, you know, I, I, I'm going to write this in my column for Monday, but he was Purdue basketball royalty, essentially, but he never leveraged it. He never, all you got from him the last couple of years was gratitude about yeah. everything Purdue did for him and how Matt Painter stood up for him so many times and how Elliot took care of him and all of this stuff, how much his relationship with that staff had to be one of a kind in the country. And I mean, He's incredibly close with Painter. He's incredibly cl- close with Elliot. Literally family. And I think that – I shouldn't say literally when it's not literally, but yeah. as, close, as close to family as you can get. And I think, you know, Cliz's significance, you know, toward Purdue, this has always been a program that has always tried to project its past, you know, uh, in terms of loyalty, in terms of a lot of old school sort of sensibilities, you know, everything Gene Cady put in place here. Larry was kind of one of those bridges from everything Purdue's been to where Purdue's going. And obviously he's been, he was very close with Cady. He was very close with Painter. And he's one of those old heads that, you know, um, was kind of around uh, for so long under Cady, but also carried over into the, uh, into the Matt Painter era here, him, Tom Ryder, people like that, that, you know, Matt Painter's really kind of leaned on, um, you know, for counsel over the years and for friendship and and whatever else. But he was just an enormous part of that program. The players liked him. Everybody around him, I think, valued their time with him. I always came to appreciate his wisdom. He was, he was mm-hmm. an interesting guy to talk to. If you think of him as just the voice on the radio or just kind of that Ron Burgundy sort of caricature, <laughs> um, had a little bit of that to him, too. Uh, oh, he did. He did. He he was so much more than that. I mean, he was one of the most thoughtful people I knew. Uh, I had some relatively in-depth conversations with him over the years, uh, over relatively serious matters. And he very insightful, very wise. And, you know, I didn't get a chance to spend as much time with him the last couple of years, obviously, and obviously spend time with no one the last year. But I remember before the Northwestern game at Northwestern last year, for whatever reason, I didn't have a lot to do before the game. I must have had all my work done or whatever. So I, I just went down to the floor and I, I, I just kind of sat down there with him for about 15, 20 minutes and just chatted. And that was actually probably the last conversation I've, I ever had with him. Um, I'm very, very glad that I did that. But I can think of numerous instances over the years where he'd be at practice, I'd be at practice. We'd sit next to one another and just chat. And it very rarely was about basketball. It was usually, usually – about World War II, about 
various illnesses, about various medicines, whatever it might be. And um, always just a fascinating guy to talk to. Obviously, his life wasn't always, you know, the straightest line, uh, but he, I think he left the world as the best version of himself. I, I think he grew considerably, you know, over the years. And what I will remember most about Larry is just the wisdom and the gratitude that he always kind of wore on his sleeve. Yeah, well said. And I think, you know, I know he felt that the kinship with you over the years, certainly. And that was an important thing. And I, I was impressed today, obviously, and not surprising, but just uh, the uh, cavalcade, cascade, I should say, a number of uh, uh, tweets from a number of folks that, uh, you know, reached out to him to say exactly that he was more than Purdue basketball, but, uh, uh, he was pretty, he was royalty and a very unique class of broadcaster, kind of an old school situation, but, uh, uh, in basketball. And you're right. You know, you think about the fact that he stood up at, uh, uh, Matt Painter's wedding, and that was reciprocated as well in Larry, one of Larry's recent weddings, and uh, that was important as well. Tom, you obviously, we talked last week, you know, you, you like me, uh, can remember him doing games. I remember him doing football back in the, and I remember when he got here in the late 70s and was hired by Henry Rosenthal, WASK, but, uh, you know, again, a unique voice and and says a lot about Purdue fans, I think, and and Larry Clisby, that relationship that, uh, uh, that that this was a very very close tie. Yeah, Henry Rosenthal. Wow, it's another name from the past. Alan, yeah, I, yeah. I did. I you people should check out Alan's tribute on the website. Uh, just a lot of good anecdotes. Alan's a good storyteller, and and uh, you kind of get another layer texture to uh to larry clisby's life and career at purdue and yeah i was like you alan i was it was larry clisby and lanny Siegel, right yeah right the, the color guy of course a lot of us still know lanny yeah big white Sox fan <clears throat> and uh i remember watching even after i got out of college larry uh larry clisby doing the jim coletto show when he said the coaches shows and the fred Aker show <laughs> yeah way back in, yeah you know, yeah. Brian, I think I think Brian summed it up well. You know, what more? What a better way? Uh, if somebody could say that about me, when I perished, that I left a, as a better version of myself. I mean, um, you know, that's 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 the biggest challenge we all have is conquering ourselves, not a world or a nation. But if we can conquer ourselves, and and it sounds like Larry did that. And uh, you know, I uh, like I said, it was, it was a life well lived. And uh, I think you guys summed it up best. You guys were closer to him, obviously, over the years. But I had glimpses here or there over time. But I certainly understood his importance to Purdue and obviously especially that basketball program. You know, Brian, I like what you said about his 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 gratitude down the stretch. And that was certainly certainly, you know, and Larry had some and you said, well, that he was not perfect. Very disappointing when he lost the football job and uh, uh, in the mid '90s, and and Joe McConnell came in, and uh, that was very very disappointing to Larry. But uh, basketball and Gene Cady, uh, they they kept uh, very very close together, and 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 Matt Painter obviously that continued that, and 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 went to bat for Larry uh, certainly yeah. to to keep Larry in that position. Uh, and I, I was surprised, Brian, just not surprised. I was just glad that is that the, 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 the outpouring of support for him. I, I shouldn't say I was surprised. I just think even on our readership, uh, people just love the fact that Larry, Larry was a homer, loved Purdue, but uh, Larry was a lot more than just basketball too. He had a lot going on outside of that. But when he did basketball and when he was passionate about Purdue basketball, he was passionate about it. And, uh, yeah. you know, I think there's no other, no other way to say it. Go ahead. He, Brian. Was, he was, I mean, I, I, I can't, speak much to his presence on the air because I'm at the games. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I don't, I don't necessarily hear him, but from what I always, my impression was always, he was almost the perfect voice of Purdue basketball. I mean, he's, he was, you know, Purdue's kind of built around sort of old school sensibilities and he was kind of cut from that era. He, I think he had a little bit of a kind of a weathered uh, life lived sort of voice and, I think he obviously wore it on his sleeve and, you know, yeah. part of, uh, you know, produce generations long identity is just no pretense. And I don't think, I don't think you got any pretense from Larry. I, I think he was, um, he was what you saw, 
what you experienced and uh he made no apologies for it he was he was as as unique an individual as i think i've i've probably known um he was it, it sounds unbelievably cliched and trite to say a guy was one of a kind but i'll be damned if i've ever known another yeah. larry clisby and i'll be damned if i ever do you won't. You know, it's funny, Tom, because I can remember in the, in the dark, dark days of the Fred Akers era, you just turn on the radio and you could tell in 20 seconds how bad it was going. <laughs> they were down 45 to three, uh, which which they were a few times. A lot of bad. Uh, but he, he, he wore it on his sleeve. And he, I always said Larry was a terrific television guy on radio. And that's not damning him. That's just saying that's kind of because you're right. He had the big voice. And he brought it that, but he, he was, you could tell quickly in basketball. I think he really got better at that because pretty won a lot in basketball and had a <laughs> lot of success. And uh, that was part of it. But uh, <laughs> you could tell in a hurry uh, how things were going when, when you, when you tune in. Yeah. Again, I mean, I was talking today to, to Mike Carmen about other iconic voices at other schools and, and what treasures those guys are. They've become almost institutionalized. Yeah. Uh, part of the institution, I should say. Probably better. Way to say it, <laughs> that but, too. Uh, you know, like Paul Keels at Ohio State, you know, uh, you know, George Blaha at Michigan State. Don Fisher. Don Great. Fisher in Indiana. I'm <clears throat> sure other schools outside the Big Ten. Uh, Gary Dolphin at Iowa. Yeah. Um, those type guys, uh, you know, are, are iconic and, and, again, part of the fabric of those athletic departments. And, and, and that's the voice that fans resonate with. That's the voice that brings them their beloved alma mater, their beloved university. And you, you, you develop a, a relationship uh, over those airwaves. And I, I've done it yeah. with, with uh, various announcers over the years. If you like that, you're, you're your friend. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that, that's, that's another great thing you can say about Larry is, is, is his ability to connect with Purdue fans. And again, Brian, as he's always does so well, I think summed up the Larry Clisby, uh, you know, image as really being similar to, to the Purdue fans, a, a blue collar guy comes with no pretense and you know, always got to work a little bit harder. And uh, again, uh, I'm, I'm ever grateful that I got a chance to experience him, him doing this thing for Purdue. Yeah, it's a sad day, and and yet, uh, uh, you know, the intimacy he created in radio, which is which is the perfect medium for that, as we all know, uh, he's excellent at getting that done. And uh, Purdue fans, he'll never be forgotten. And uh, I, I think it, it as long as uh, Matt Painter and Elliot Bloom and the Nate Barretts of the world and uh, are around, that to, uh, to to remember his legacy. All right, Brian. Uh, obviously, and Larry, we're uh, on his last night on earth. Uh, the the was a great one for Purdue basketball last night, a very, very impressive win uh, at Penn state. Uh, and, you know, you, when you win 20 by 21 points in, in happy Valley, that's impressive. Brian, I, this team just seems to really show that uh, it, it can do just about anything. Uh, uh, you know, having slept on it to now, uh, any other great insight to what you saw uh, in that win at Penn state? Well, they look better when they make shots, and uh, yeah. Purdue obviously made seven bullseyes last night um, yeah. for Larry, which was was uh, you know something they hadn't been doing is shooting particularly well this season. But other, I mean, you just watch the game; it was a total clinic. I mean, it was as impressive a performance as you know Purdue's put together all season, and they were really good at Indiana. But when you watch what they did at both ends of the floor in that first half. The uh, and I only went back and watched the first half because the first half told you everything you needed to know, and I just wanted to cut it short. Um, <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Um, but that their energy on defense, their preparedness on defense, were extraordinary. I mean, th they were a step ahead of Penn State on defense. On defense, Purdue was ahead of Penn State's offense. Uh, it felt like you saw them seeing what Penn State was about to do before Penn State did it, reacting accordingly and just dominating the game. Offensively, you just saw a real purpose in everything Purdue did. Uh, pristine execution, uh, good screening, good good ball movement, good everything. It was just, you know, I, I wouldn't want to bet against Purdue and its staff, you know, on extra uh, prep time and that's why uh, Purdue had a couple extra days to prepare for Penn State. 
um, and looked like it. And it was just an absolute buzzsaw uh, last night. Purdue wins by 20, I can't wow. remember, 73 to 52, right? The box right, score. I remember the score was screwed up last yeah, night. It was. They had, a, they had a wrong box score for about, for about right. the first half hour, but yes. They, yeah, I'm, that's exactly what I'm reading off right now because I printed yeah. it off right after the game. They won by 21 points, but they only scored 71 points. But anybody who watched the game, you know they could have scored 90 uh, the way they operated offensively. Just with 11 and a half minutes to go, they just took the air out of the ball and just stopped scoring. But I, I was astonished like halfway through the game when I looked up and they had like 52 points and it felt like they had like 75. Yeah, Because if you just watch the game, you just saw a team that could do whatever it wanted, whenever it wanted to do it. And I, I mean, I, I was a little bit disappointed in Penn State uh, in terms of I thought they were going to be you know, better than that. But I think Purdue just broke them. Um, yeah. And that that happens from time to time. But, uh, you know, Purdue's got a lot going for it here. I keep saying that every week, but it does. I, I, I think it's very much trending in the right direction um, in a lot of ways. I think defensively, they're – They've actually quiet, very quietly become pretty good. Uh, you know, Jaden Ivey's playing great. Sasha Stefanovic has played great now the last three halves of basketball. Um, they're winning without needing Travion Williams to score 20, 25 points a game. And six weeks ago, you had no chance if, if Travion Williams didn't score a lot. And I, I just think they're, they're, everything's kind of clicking right now. Yeah. yeah, boy, you had some good things to say, Brian, last night on your Twitter about Aaron Wheeler, um, one of his better, probably his best game of the year. I think you would agree with that. And talk about that and in the starting lineup change too, correct? Uh, and typically that's not something Matt Painter does if things are going smoothly. What Brandon Newman sat, Silvanovich started. Uh, do you have any reason? I'm not sure if you asked that question after the game. but I did. Yeah. Um, yeah, he did. He what did. was up with that? Well, he just – he used it as a vehicle to compliment Stefanovic and said, he, you know, he, he's kind of, he steadies us. He's, he's a really important presence. Obviously he is. I, I didn't think that Painter would mess with his starting five this late in the season. I didn't really have any really good reason to believe that. I, I just didn't think it was a Painter thing, Painter type thing to do to change the starting lineup when you're winning. Uh, but obviously I was wrong and it's hard to argue, you know, Sasha Stefanovic's place in that starting five. He obviously is, obviously belongs there, uh, circumstances, all that got him out of there. Yeah. Um, you know, it, in terms of the Brandon Newman part of it, you know, I, I think foul trouble really held him back yesterday. He's going to have to, uh, you know, acclimate a little bit, I guess, to coming off the bench now. I thought he'd been doing some really good things defensively. Uh, I think he has to make sure he maintains that part of it, you know, coming off the bench now. I wouldn't, if I were Newman, I wouldn't view this as, as it, as a demotion, I would view this as you're now the sixth starter instead of the fifth starter and understand Sasha Stefanovic's value to this team and why that needs to be in the starting five. And you know, Jade, it was Jade Nivey who moved into the starting five for yeah. Stefanovic. Obviously, he's not coming out of the starting five ever again at Purdue. <laughs> uh, never. As long as he's at Purdue, he will start every game the rest of the way, provided he's healthy. Um, to the other part of your question uh, about Aaron Wheeler, yeah, you know, people view Aaron Wheeler through his shooting percentage because, you know, I think when he was a redshirt freshman, that's where he he made his impact uh, right away was he he made threes. He made wide open threes. And the following season, he stopped making those threes, you know, for the most part. I think that way of viewing Aaron Wheeler now is is, is not all that appropriate. I think now – and starting last year, you should have viewed him more as the guy, what he can do for you when he rebounds, when he defends, when he runs the floor, when he, he deflects passes, when he's engaged defensively, things like that. Now, he's not been consistent there either. Um, but when he does that stuff, that's where he matters. Uh, it's not just the threes. When he's 0 for 4 from 3 or whatever, you know, you've, you've seen a number of times over the last two seasons – you'd prefer him to not be 0 for 4, but it's also not a deal where that's the only way he can provide value. Uh, the ways he can provide value are all the things I just mentioned below. The last two games, he's absolutely been doing that at a really high level. And, hey, as it turns out, when he's doing that, the threes go in too. So um, it, it, that's always been the deal with Wheeler. It's just when he's playing with energy, when he's engaged, when he's using his a athleticism productively, um, through effort and all that stuff, 
that's when he's really valuable. And he's never, he's not going to be the 15 point a game guy for Purdue ever. He's got to be that Mike Robinson sort of guy who goes from a three point shooter to being kind of a garbage man and being a little things guy. And that's, that's the step Purdue's needed him to make. Consistency has never really come his way the last two years, but two good games in a row here, if that sets the tone for more positive contributions when the games are more important here in a couple weeks, uh, great. Yeah, that's a good uh, – it's an interesting co- comparison with Mike Robinson. He's a longer Mike Robinson. I like his length. He does bring you some certain things around the basket – and he runs, you know, he had a couple of hustle plays. He's had several hustle plays of just being there, getting the ball back in the hoop and and uh, making a big difference. And he can make a big difference as Purdue runs, uh, hopefully from a Purdue fan standpoint, that uh, can can make the run that it wants to make. All right. Now, the one thing that's interesting is uh, obviously, and there are a number of scenarios, and Purdue still has two, ra- two scheduled games to play. Wisconsin at 9 p.m. I believe it's 9 or 9.30, a late night game on, on Tuesday night, then Indiana on next Saturday. And the Hoosiers, uh, excuse me, the, the Iowa, basically the scenario is this. If, 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 if Purdue can win both those games and Iowa loses and – and probably Purdue would have to play Nebraska in that scenario too. Uh, the Boilermakers can get to that four seed and that double bye. Yet they'll probably face Iowa in in game one. Uh, pretty much either way they go, uh, you know. So that part's going to be an interesting storyline to watch. Does that does this matter right now? I mean, right now I'm not seeing right now anybody in the league, with maybe the exception of Illinois and Michigan, that uh, is heads heads and shoulders above where Purdue is right now. I think it matters because. I think you still want to win the Big Ten tournament. Yeah. Um, I mean, you obviously, anytime you don't get the regular season title, uh, I think if you want to win a title during the season, you know, the Big Ten tournament's the next best thing. Mm-hmm. I think the double buy helps you do that, uh, potentially. Uh, you know, you'd still have to go through Michigan at some point, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, but I don't know how much it matters to Purdue from an NCAA tournament perspective. And there's always that age old question is, do you want the extra games? Do you want the potential for momentum going into the NCAA tournament or do you want the rest? And I don't know how to answer that question. You know, I would say the extra rest or whatever would, would, would be helpful, but it's not like Purdue's, you know, um, it's not like it hasn't been a shortened season already. And it's not like Purdue hasn't uh, had a bunch of guys who sat out a bunch of basketball this season. Anyway, I'd almost, the way Purdue's trending right now, I'd almost rather keep playing if I'm them and just get as many wins as you can get. I every bit want to play that last Nebraska game just to just out of the sheer vanity of padding my win total potentially. Um, keep sharpening the knife, so to speak. Uh, that would be my stance on the matter. If I'm Purdue, I want to play as many games the rest of the way as possible, but understand the NCAA tournament is the most important part of this season. And, uh, I think Purdue will be fine either way. Yeah, and that scenario may be, you know, as Brian has reported, uh, talked about the fact that Northwestern plays uh, plays uh, Nebraska on that final Sunday of the regular season, and it, in all likelihood, Purdue would, if they need to play that game, the Wild, uh, the Cornhuskers, I should say, could bust down to West Lafayette and play that game maybe Monday night or Tuesday night, uh, the week of the Big Ten tournament. We shall see if that game ends up being necessary. All right, Tom, um, you know, a spring football is well underway now, and we're still not out of the month of February, but Jeff Brom was available after today's scrimmage. Uh, I know it's tough because we're not well. You're not seeing scrimmage, but you you are talking to the coach and and getting some feedback on where he thinks uh, his team is right now. Uh, what are you gleaning from uh, what you've heard and talked to coaches so far with the way way practice is going? Yeah, guys, they are 33 percent of the way through spring football already. Okay. Like you yeah. said, Alan, it's February 27th. Uh, I'm all for it. I like getting going here. March 19th, it's the final practice. Purdue uh, had a scrimmage today. They will have two more scrimmages during spring practices. And, yeah, we, we talked to uh, Brad Lambert as well on Friday for the first time ever. And like you said, Al, we got Jeff Brom today after the scrimmage. So between two of those guys, uh, we learned quite a bit, I think. Um, they're very forthcoming. 
Brad Lambert's a breath of fresh air, a great guy. Uh, he's a disciple of Jim Grobe, the Wake Forest coach. And if anybody knows Jim Grobe, uh, Brad Lambert is exactly like Jim Grobe, a great person and probably a pretty good football coach too. Uh, you know, the defense for Purdue, like we thought, it's going to be based on a four-man front. And there are some personnel issues. There's a lot of guys out, fellas. Uh, just a lot of personnel is missing here. Um, I think the biggest takeaway here, we, we thought this was going to happen, is Demarcus Mitchell is going to play a Leo spot, guys, a lot like Derek Barnes in 2019. This defense mm. sounds like it's going to be pretty similar to what Nick Holt was trying to do. It'd be very aggressive. And, again, that Leo spot, you know, Mitchell's going to be able to put pressure as a rusher. He's going to drop into coverage. They want to move him around. They want to move Carl Office around as well. Brahm's concerned about the, the defensive tackle spot right now. Lawrence Johnson's now out with injury. Um, that doesn't help. I know Anthony Watts is dinged up too. You know, Jeff had a lot of good things to say about Corey Trice, Diedrich Mackey. At cornerback, he said Geo Howard was playing well until he got hurt. Um, so, again, there, there's, there's some – there's some positive signs here, but again, they're missing quite a bit of personnel. Jalen Alexander's out. Uh, of course, Johnny Karloftis isn't practicing either, but, but, but they're, they're making do with what they've gotten offensively, guys. No super big revelations there. David Bell, uh, I learned, you know, Jeff said isn't practicing. They just want him to get healthy. I guess he kind of had some injuries last year. There's no need to get your franchise out there anyway. They know what David Bell can do, and they just want to make sure he convalesces and doesn't sustain any injuries. Milton Wright got hurt on Friday, I guess, or actually the first day of practice, I should say. He's out, so the receiving core is missing their two top options right now. Um, the center, Sam Garvin's out. Gus Hartwig is snapping the ball. I think Gus Hartwig can end up being the center anyway. So, again, a lot of stuff like that. And, uh, and you know, he was frustrated today, I think, more than anything by the special teams, guys. Um, they spent a lot of time on it today. And the kicking in particular was not good. And he seemed very displeased by that. So a lot of work to do in the kicking game with J.D. Dellinger gone. Yeah, Brian, I'll give you the last word here as we wrap up this, uh, this uh, Saturday conversation. You can talk about anything you want to talk about, but in football or anything else that you want to add to the fray as we uh, put a close to this, uh, this uh, podcast. If you could string that question along a little longer, I'd appreciate it. i got to think of something. <laughs> okay, I will. Uh, <laughs> no way. You know, like, you know, and I guess my uh, my other comment for you is, you look at football, and obviously, spring ball so early. Uh, Jeff Brom in need of you know setting the tone. It, it appears, you know, you look at the guys they brought in on 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 defense. That these got guys with experience. We know Mark Hagan well, but that's got to help uh, uh, get this thing turned around, one would think, would at least give them an opportunity to get things going. You've talked a lot about the need for that defense to be really good. Uh, that's a, certainly going to be something that uh, if they're going to get back to where they want to be and, and get better than they were actually ever were, uh, it's got to be good. Yeah, and job one has to be simply to connect with these players uh, too. I, I, yeah. I think last year's uh, coordinator uh, – yeah. Obviously, I I think there was there was a lot of tumult behind the scenes uh, with all of that. I, I think the players, you know, there was a significant disconnect there. And I think the most important thing these new defensive coaches can do from day one is get across to those players, connect with them, and um, establish themselves as guys that these guys want to play for. And I think you know, spring ball always tells you only so much. I mean, we just ran through the whole laundry list of important guys who aren't even practicing. So yeah. right. it's kind of the absurdity of spring ball sometimes. It's like like you're practicing with guys who you're practicing with a skeleton crew so often, almost every year because it's surgery season. And uh, it, it just, there's only so much you can tell from a uh, football perspective, but it's the behind the scenes stuff. It's the time that these players are getting to know Brad Lambert or connecting with Ron English or coming to appreciate Mark Hagan's intensity or whatever it might be. That's the important stuff uh, that that's happening this spring. Um, and that's the important – that's, you know, in the big picture of Purdue football right now, that's probably one of the most important things anyway. It's just that everybody here gets on the same page, gets on the same playing field, and gets moving in a positive direction. Yeah, I think that's a good point, and I think that's going to be a storyline that uh, 
We won't know for sure how that all is going to shake out till or till September the fourth when Purdue opens its season against Oregon State in in Ross Aid Stadium. So, all right, guys, uh, we always appreciate your time, and uh, again, we miss, wish every, everyone that uh, is involved uh, with the life of Larry Clisby in one form or another uh, uh, some solace and a very difficult day from that standpoint, and. Uh, Hard to do uh, justice to that uh, and how we all feel about Larry, but uh, uh, we appreciate it all that he did for us all, for all those years as well. So I want to thank our sponsor, also the Purdue Union Club Hotel. And a reminder, too, if you're interested, 40-day uh, free trials are available for goldenblack.com. Please consider subscribing. So uh, we'll see you and talk again uh, down the road. Uh, we'll have our Monday podcast, Golden Black Radio. A lot of coverage this week is men's basketball. Uh, gets to the peak part of its season. And of course, uh, spring football coverage with Tom Deanhart as well. So have a great week, everybody. Thanks for watching and listening. And we'll see you down the road on goldenblack.com.